A reading from Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padamaram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if this is to be the way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her, when her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. The boys grew up. Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I'm famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went away. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and am determined to keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips and teach me your judgments. My life is always in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. The decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever and to the end. This is a reading from Romans chapter 8. There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, for those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 
but you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you. Hear what the spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. <clears throat> And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed. As he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Anyone with ears, listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a little while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good morning. And welcome to parable season. Uh, the parable of the sower is one of seven parable stories in the 13th chapter of Matthew. Now, this is a, uh, this is a, a forewarning. I'm, I'm the one in high school English class who never figured out that Moby Dick was something other than a story about a fisherman and a fish. Um, and that hasn't changed. Uh, I read Life of Pi not too long ago, and it never occurred to me that that this was something other than a story about a boy and a tiger in a boat. The idea that the tiger was God in hiding and that when God makes an appearance, the, the boy in the boat's afraid, which is often our reaction. Um, so while a lot of people get excited about parables, I kind of go, okay, I'm, let me see what I'm going to miss this time. Uh, so Jesus is teaching from the prow of a boat because it's the only place he can find to sit. So many have come to hear him, to learn from him, to touch and be touched by him, that there's no space left in their midst. He begins to tell them stories in which images of God's kingdom are as familiar as the crops in their own fields. 
and that these ordinary things have something to do with God's purpose for us. Parables are most often described as earthly stories with heavenly images or heavenly meanings. They invite us in and are meant to disarm us, to take us briefly away from hearing only with our minds so that we might hear also with our hearts. Some biblical scholars have said that Jesus spoke in parables because the religious authorities were starting to take notice, maybe even feeling a little threatened by what he was saying. And so it may have been a way for Jesus to stay out of jail. He was talking about stones and soil and not directly about them. He spoke in parables so that those who did listen with their hearts more than their heads might hear what he was saying. Listen, says Jesus, beginning today's parable of sower. Listen, the sower went to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, other seeds fell on rocky ground, other seeds fell among thorns, and other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain. Let anyone with ears listen. So when I sat down to start writing for this morning, I had the same response that I always do to this parable. I start worrying about what kind of ground I was on with God. I started worrying about how many birds were in my field, how many rocks, how many thorns. I started worrying about how I could clean them all up, how I could turn myself into a well-tilled, well-weeded, well-fertilized field for the sowing of God's word. I wrestled around with this for several days, trying to massage and squeeze the parable in different ways to try and find some new moral of the story to pop out. It's my usual response to this parable. I hear it as a challenge to be different, as a call to improve my life so that if the same parable were ever told about me, it would have a happier ending with all of the seed falling on rich and fertile soil. After the evening contemplative prayer service for healing this past Wednesday, I sat quietly out on my screen porch, listening to the night sounds. I pulled up on my computer what I had written so far for today's sermon. I looked at the heading on my page, the parable of the sower, and started writing, picking up again with sorting through the various possible meanings for the different kinds of soil. In the dark woods, outside our screen porch, I started watching the fireflies, momentarily mesmerized by the dancing lights amidst the stillness and silence of the forest. I lingered on the random moving points of light for several moments before turning back to my page, seeing again in bold lettering the parable of the sower. It was late and I was ready to call it a night. I started closing my computer thinking again about the nature's night, about nature's night lights, when I thought, wait a minute, it's the parable of the sower, not the parable of the soil. I sat back down and started wondering, is it possible that after all these years, I had missed the whole point and message of the parable? Now, like I said at the beginning, and those who know me would say, oh yeah, you often miss the point, no surprise here. How often, how often have I heard this parable and think it's a story about me, about us? But what if it's not about us or what kind of soil we are? What if it's about the sower? What if it's not about our own successes and failures and birds and rocks and thorns? but about the extravagance of the sower who doesn't seem to care about these things, who flings seed everywhere, wastes it with holy abandon, who feeds the birds, whistles at the rocks, picks his way through the thorns, shouts hallelujah at the good soil and just keeps on throwing out seed, just keeps on sowing, confident that there's enough seed to go around. If this really is the parable of the sower and not a parable about the different kinds of ground we imagine ourselves to be, then the focus 
is not on us and our shortfalls, but on the generosity of our maker, the prolific sower who does not seem concerned about the condition of the fields, who's not stingy with the seed, but casts it everywhere on good soil and bad, who's not cautious or judgmental or even practical, but who seems willing to keep reaching into the seed bag for all eternity, covering the whole creation with fertile seeds, fertile seeds of love. The seed falls everywhere. Sometimes it gets snatched away. Sometimes it dies in shallow soil or gets choked out. Sometimes it grows and when it does, the harvest is a wide spectrum of miracles. There's not the faintest tint that the sower considers the nature of the soil as he flings the seed. He just lets it fly scatter shot in every direction. Judith is always encouraging us, creating space and enabling us if we choose to go deeper into our own selves, into our own selves and our own souls. And so deeper inside this parable, we find a bedrock assumption, an assumption of abundance that we too rarely recognize and trust. There's more than enough seed. And the God who makes sun to shine and rain to fall upon both the righteous and the unrighteous is indiscriminate about sharing. God's grace is flung like the seed and shows up everywhere. The sower just lets it fly. I was truly blessed years ago to have Henry Nallen as a teacher and a friend. When I was in seminary many years ago, Henry was a Dutch-born Catholic priest who passed away in September of 1996. He taught at Notre Dame, at Yale, at Harvard. He held a number of doctorate degrees and he wrote over 40 books on spirituality. And yet he would say that the most important work that he did, certainly for others, but even more so for himself, was his work as the priest director of a community for those with mental health disabilities just outside of Toronto called Daybreak. Henry's move to Daybreak was unexpected. I'm guessing even for him. He wrote that the first thing he noticed when arriving to work each day was that their liking or disliking of him had absolutely nothing to do with his successes in life. Since none of them could read his books, his books couldn't impress any of them. And since none of them had gone to Notre Dame or Yale or Harvard, it didn't matter that Henry was a brilliant professor. Henry made it his habit to sit and eat with the residents of the community every day. And he fondly recalls one night at dinner when he offered to pass the meatloaf to one of the residents. Another resident sitting at the same table exclaimed loudly, no, 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 father, don't give him any meat. He doesn't eat meat, he's a Presbyterian. Henry entitled his chapter where he told this wonderful dinner story the temptation to be relevant. He explains just how formative this experience at daybreak was because it forced him to rediscover his most basic identity. These simple, he would say often childlike, completely unpretentious people forced Henry to let go of everything that he thought made him important everything that he thought that made him relevant. His degrees, his ability to speak multiple languages, his insights into theology and spirituality weren't important. In his new role, all he was left with, particularly in the eyes of his new housemates, was his humanity. That fact that at his most basic level, he was just another person, equal in dignity, equal in value, equal in bad habits, and equal in the need to be saved by God's grace. I believe that if I was to ask Henry today, he would say that that moment in his life, when he realized his simplicity in the midst of his new reality, 
was the closest he came here on earth to the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Not the reception of his doctorates or his lectures on the mysteries of mystical spirituality. It was right there at that dinner table when all his defenses and titles were shed. In the most basic moments of the human condition, that the grace of God actually made itself present. The kingdom of heaven is like, we heard this phrase this morning, and we will hear it over and over again over the next couple of weeks in this parable tour through the book of Matthews. The kingdom of heaven is like the sower who went out to sow the fields of our souls only to find rocky ground, thorny bushes, trampled pathways, along with some good soil. The kingdom of heaven is like that same man who sowed seed in the garden of his own soul and despite his best efforts, the wheat he wanted came up mixed with weeds. The kingdom of heaven is like the smallest, most insignificant seed that no one believes will ever grow up into a magnificent tree. That's the point of the story about Henry. And I believe it's the point of all these parables. We find God catch a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven in all of the unremarkable and ordinary moments in our lives. A parable points to our rocky ground and thorny personalities and clumsy pathways and tells us that's okay. The wheat grows in our soul's field right in the midst of weeds, and that's okay. The mustard seed, shows us just how small we really are. And that's okay. Because in all of these parables, one thing is the same. The kingdom of heaven, the real presence of God in our midst, the encounter with God's grace, involves the honest admission, the realization that we're human, sometimes ridiculous, often filled with, filled with anxiety, usually feeling small, and insignificant, and this is exactly when we finally arrive into the heart of the kingdom of heaven. This is where God's grace meets us and abounds in its fullness. Once upon a time, a sower went out to, the, to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came along and devoured them. So he put his seed pouch down, and he spent the next hour or so stringing aluminum foil all around his field and putting up a scarecrow. Then he returned to his sowing, but he noticed some of the seeds were falling onto rocky ground. So he put his seed pouch down again and went to fetch his wheelbarrow and shovel. A couple of hours later, he had dug up the rocks and was trying to think of something useful he could do with them when he remembered his sowing and he got back to it. But as soon as he did, he ran right into the briar patch that was sure to strangle his little seedlings. So he pulled the thorns up by hand and by the time he had the briars cleared, it was getting dark. So the sower picked up his pouch and his tools and decided to call it a day. When he awoke the next morning, he walked out into his field and he found a big crow sitting on his scarecrow. He found rocks he had not found the day before and he found new leaves on the roots of the briars that had broken off in his hands. The sower considered all this, pushing his cap back on his head, he began to laugh just the chuckle at first, and then a full-fledged guffaw. Still laughing, he picked up his seed pouch and he began flinging seeds everywhere, into the roots of trees, onto the roof of his house, across all the fences, into his neighbor's fields. He shook seeds at his cows and he offered a handful to the dog. He tossed a fistful into the creek, thinking they might take root downstream somewhere. The more he sowed, the more he seemed to have. So what if the parable this morning really is about the extravagance of a sower who flings seed everywhere, helter-skelter, with holy abandon, who walks among the rocks, picks his way through the thorns, tossing the seeds about, knowing some of them will feed the birds, but knowing also that when the harvest comes, it will fill every barn to the raft. What if the parable 
is still also about us. Not what kind of soul we are, but offering us an answer to the question we all keep asking ourselves in these challenging times of pandemic and the work we are doing to recognize and acknowledge systemic racism. What can I do? What should I do? How can I help? In this week's daily meditations, we kept reading from Judith and Porter and Christy, do the next right thing. Do the next small thing. Do what is right in front of you. Maybe we are also being told this morning, throw your seed everywhere. Doing the next right thing or the next small thing. We may not know if it will take root and grow, but throw it anyway and throw it everywhere with holy abandon. Our lives are filled with God's abundant and overwhelming grace. In the midst of broken lives and broken dreams, on the hard paths many of us are walking, through the thorny bushes that are wounding us and so many others, it's easy to forget, to lose track of God's grace. Till we remember to look in all of the ordinary and unremarkable places, because that's where we get close to God's kingdom. That is where God is just letting it fly. Thanks be. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we, we all, all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name, name may, may be glorified, glorified by all people. people. We pray for all bishops, priests, deacons. That, that they, they may, may be faithful, faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That, that there, there may, may be justice, justice and peace, peace on, on the earth. earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That, that our works may find favor in your sight. sight. Have compassion on those who suffer any grief or trouble. That, that they, they may, may be delivered from, from their distress. distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine, shine upon them. them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May, May we, we also come, come to share in your, your heavenly kingdom. kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We hold these persons in prayer. Cindy, Finney, Charles, Charles, Winnie, Sam, Victoria, Christine, Susan, Jim, Sarah, Harlan, Soraya, Jocelyn, Joe, Michael, Jim, Kalina and her parents, John, Janice, David, Daniel, Case, Emily, Brad, Betty, Margaret, Courtney, Carolyn Jim, and Dean. O oh Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever.
We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, in your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Most um, almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all mercy and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image. <laughs> going to start over. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and you called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death. You and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. And sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, it is by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, 
Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. And we pray at this time of communion, the people pray with me. Holy one, present in the blessed sacrament of the altar, with thanksgiving we proclaim your resurrection in us and in the world. In the sacrament of this moment, I recognize the sacrament that you are in me and in this community of faith, resides spiritually in us, in our body, in our minds, in our spirits, that we would be strengthened by your love and made one in you and in one another. We live in you and you in us in this moment, in this life, and in the life that is to come. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you, with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your life may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God, who creates us, redeems us, and gives us new life, be upon us this day and remain with us always. Amen. Christy, will you offer the peace? The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.